Greetings everyone and welcome back to 365 Days of Prague. Today we're going to be reviewing the album Sacred Baboon by the band Yezda Urfa. Hi, my name's Naomi. I'm an avid progressive rock fan, but I'm a long ways from knowing all the Prague albums out there. But this year, I'm going to give it a try. This is 365 Days of Prague. You know, I think this year we've encountered many exotic names, but when it comes to Yes the Urfa, well, it's like one of those most obscure and definitely quite exotic names, but it's not hard to pronounce, which is something good because I hate it when that happens. I just hate making pronunciation errors, and I'm gonna make a lot of them in this video probably. So yeah, enjoy that and enjoy some of my favorite bits from this album. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes, the Urfa, the band which I probably just had no idea that they existed when I started the series this year, despite the fact that I had an album of theirs on the list already. But then I was somewhat reassured of their existence when, in my second live stream where I took song recommendations, someone decided to recommend Texas Armadillo by Yes, the Urfa to me. And that comes from their first album. Technically, I'm gonna talk about it in a bit, but I really liked that track. It was really, really nice and my expectations expectations for today's album was basically just one big Texas armadillo. But before the music comes the band, and well this is quite the interesting band and I like the story behind them, despite it not being too documented, I still think that it tells a nice story. So yes, the Urfa basically began in 1973 when a bunch of friends from Indiana and Illinois decided to group together to form this quintet which would play the great genre of music inspired of course by a lot of British British bands being progressive rock. Now when it actually came to choosing a name for this band, these guys were kinda just out of idea, so they decided to do the most rudimentary thing and open up a dictionary and just look up for interesting sounding words, and then maybe try and put combinations of them. And well, two words that they found were one of a city in Iran called Yezd, and another one of a metropolitan municipality in Turkey called Urfa, and well they put them two together to Yezd Urfa and to make the pronounced were clearer for people, they just call themselves Yes the Urfa. And Yes the Urfa were here to prove a point that even bands from the USA were able to produce such progressive rock that is immensely diverse, neck breaking, and quite the high energies as all of the rest of the British bands. And well, how did they do that? They did so by practically copying two of the more popular British bands in progressive rock being Yes and Gentle Giant. But let's give credit where it's due for this quintet. You see, these guys, despite Yes having a lot of various direct influences from various British prog bands, they also showed an immense amount of skill and determination in creating their own type of music. The shows that they played and the stuff that they recorded is just immensely superior in the ways of technique, which is honestly 
obviously something that you really can't look past. But despite all this and despite their music being pretty well received, no record company really discovered them and wanted to take them under their wing. So in the year of 1975, the band decided that they were gonna create a demo tape, or for the instance of this, they actually created an entire demo EP. And with this EP, they would go around various record companies trying to get someone to sign them, but unfortunately, they had just no luck. And yes, one might paint a bad picture of all these malicious record companies that didn't want to take as the earth, but honestly, look at the facts, progressive rock was never that big in the US, and this was already 1975, and it started to die out of popularity, and well, I see where they came from. Nevertheless, this demo EP would be released on the band's own unsubstantiated label, and they would create a bit of copies of it, hoping for it to revolve around and maybe, maybe one day for someone to just pick it up, but unfortunately for them, that did not happen back then. But the band was still undeterred, and determined as they was, they went on and created this time a full album on their own, funded only by them. They would revise a lot of ideas taken right off their demo tape, which was by this point called Boris as the name of the demo tape, or if you might even call it the entire album, and well, they created this one with the hopes for it to also get picked by someone. And after a recording session that took about two weeks and was being held in two separate studios, the band almost had a recording contract with a Chicago-based record company, when unfortunately, at the last moment, it just fell through. And this would prove to be the final blow for years the Earth, who by this point have exhausted a lot of their money and efforts into creating this album, yet to no success even showing off in the distance. So unfortunately, they did what every band would do, they lost hope and they didn't produce any more albums, although technically the band still remained up until 1981 when they would finally disband. And as for this second album by theirs, well, the master tapes would be shelved, and despite the fact that this album was basically entirely complete by this point, they just didn't release it, and it was forgotten for many years to come. But then suddenly, maybe a bit out of the blue, 13 years later in 1989, a man by the name of Peter Strahler discovered a copy of the original EP by Yes the Earth called Boris, and well, he listened to it and he loved what he heard, and with that he came to the producer Greg Walker, which owned the Symphonic Record Company, and together they found out that this band had yet another album that they recorded which was being shelved. So they decided to contact the band yet again, and they re-released that album in 1989 under the intended name of Sacred. The Boon. Now, the release of this album was definitely overdue. It could have come out in 1976, but instead it came out in 1981. And despite the fact that this was a time where progressive rock has fallen out of grace, I think that this was maybe also the upside for this album's existence. You see, by this point, the loyal progressive rock fans did not really have a lot of hidden gems to discover. And suddenly, just imagine yourself sitting there in 1981 and someone tells you, you know what, they just just discovered they just released this album that was made in the 70s that sounds like yes and gentle giant together and you have to listen to it I don't know what about you, I would go ahead and listen to it, and I think that's exactly what happened. And in the passage of time since then, we've seen basically two things happen. The first one is a rise in popularity of Yes the Earth, from a band that nobody knew about and they were forgotten to time for a long while, this band suddenly turned into something very well known, with a lot of ratings on the prog archives, which is something not that abundant, and that definitely shows something. But the second thing that has also happened is the criticism towards this album, mainly in the form of the band said it is copying quite directly, being mainly Yes and Gentle Giant. Now I'll point this one too out here as well, someone said that this band sounds a lot like Eklund. I don't know if that's correct, but as someone that has grown to love Eklund so much this year, I've taken offense to this saying. But honestly, if you ask me, I think that the comparison to Yes and Gentle Giant is a bit skewing the facts. I really do see where the Gentle Giant comes in here. You have the intricate vocals and the all time signatures, and of course you have the vibraphone, which is very much signature Gentle Giant. But when it comes down to it, I'd say that this album is like 85% Yes and maybe 15 Gentle Giant. For starters, the vocalist for Yes the Earth, Rick Rodenbaugh, just sounds a lot like John. 
John Anderson, despite not having the same type of voice and timbre, he does use the same techniques to achieve the same effect of the vocals, and well, it sounds a lot like him. Mark Miller on the bass basically plays in the same octane of Chris Squire. It's heavy, it's out there, it's really, really bassy, and I like that, but again, it's pretty much copying the same style, as well as, of course, Mark Tippins, which is on guitar here, which he just cannot help himself of having a classic guitar interlude in like every other song, which is something very reminiscent of Steve Howe. And how can I not mention Brad Kristoff on the drums and his very obvious source of inspiration? It's Bill Bruford. And as funny as it might be, just like what I said about Star Castle's debut album, the only one on here that doesn't really seem to be copying yet another member of Yes is the keyboardist of this band, which in this case is Phil Kimbrough. He sounds like he's playing a bit similar, but honestly he's just doing his own things, and seeing as this album is full with keyboards, I would have expected him to copy the Rick Wakeman sound, but apparently it doesn't, which brings up an interesting question now that we see that this is a consecutive opinion that I have, maybe it's just too hard to copy Wakeman, maybe it's just too hard to walk in his footsteps, and honestly I can really see that happening. In any case, the music on this album is definitely undoubtedly good, and I can look past these imitations more to just praise the final product, but you see, my own gripe with this album actually doesn't come from the comparison to Yes, but instead from a different, much simpler source. You see, my problem with this album actually has to do more with its structure, and specifically the intersong structures. There is something of an ability in progressive rock that you don't often talk about that differentiates a good artist in prog from a great artist, and that's the ability to move in a seemingly nonchalant way from one idea in a song next to the other. So take for example, you know the vocal harmonies by Anderson and Howe on Close to the Edge that somehow move into the towering church or and you know it doesn't really make sense when you think of it but on the song it does or take for example anything from the snow goose by camel for that matter and this ability to make the unrelated seem so incontrovertibly related is just a bit lost on sacred baboon and yes the earth in this album so if only the songs on this album didn't just have this very rugged sort of structure and i know that this album was created haphazardly but still it's not really an excuse for why it should be praised because you know was made with so little resources and time and stuff like that. I just think that the end result is a bit all over the place. It's rugged, it needs to be smoothed around the edges, and yes, for what it's worth, I do think that it impacts the entire album as a whole. And yes, I would love this one if it was different, but for the sake of this one, I feel like I'm losing my footing when I listen to this. There's really not a lot that I can latch onto on here and pair that with the fact that this album genuinely doesn't have a lot of very meaty parts parts to sink your teeth in, I feel like this entire album is a bit discombobulated and it just doesn't really work out with me. But all in all, I'm really not thinking that this album is a bad album, I think I'm just a bit disappointed because of my high expectations of it. And that's always a damning thing when it comes to an album because creating high expectations means that the final result can be good but it will feel worse than that because well, I wanted more. But as it stands, it's a fine album, I don't think I'll be coming back to it anytime soon soon, but honestly with my little acquaintance of Boris, I think this one I'll review next year. So I'll take a gander on here and assume that maybe some of you watching this video actually didn't or still do not know the cover that it is right here next to me and you know this album by a different cover altogether. Yes, upon release of this album in 1989, this was the original cover that it was given. We have this sunset painted with a lot of stalagmites and it looks pretty nice. But then in 1992, this album received a re-release, this time on CD, and it was accessorized with this new and interesting cover that to me looks like it was taken right out of 2001 A Space Odyssey. And I have to say, personally, I do think that the latter looks better for this album, despite it being not that great of a cover just objectively on its own. But coming back to the original one, I think that it's a cool cover nevertheless. It's a bit too general in a way, I really don't know how to say it, but I I think it just lacks a bit of details to give it some more personality, but for what it's worth, I think it's a nice cover, but it doesn't do much more than that. So this might come as a bit of a shock for some of you, but I think that it's a fair rating for this album because it's gonna get a rating of 7 out of 10. 
but that's about it guys i hope that you enjoyed this video and stay tuned for tomorrow because we're going to be listening to ever by the band iq i of course want to thank my lovely supporters over on patreon so thank you so much to clay Wan, rist of kings and Lindsay haycox you guys are just the best and if any of you want to support me over on patreon you can find the link down in the description or in my about page but that's about it guys have a wonderful day and i'll catch you all tomorrow bye guys